you go into the rioters? Yeah. Hmm. I knew that. And so I went in and I, I pulled together the leaders and I said, um, do you trust me? And they said, you yes, them no. Hmm. And I said, will you give me two weeks to fix this? And you had your shots and they were told, you know, somebody will pick you up. I prayed over this and I think God is calling me to Mexico. <laughs> it's and, always and, a trick. And they smiled and they said, you know, that's funny because we <laughs> prayed on it last night too. We think God is calling you to Bolivia. <laughs> God put it on my heart um, to walk up behind this woman, put my arm around her shoulder and say, would you like to run away with me to Guatemala? <laughs> <laughs> So Casey, I have a question for you. Actually, Cheers. it's a two-parter. Okay. Uh, do you believe in aliens? And I like where this is going. If aliens exist, would you go on mission to their planet? Uh, how intelligent are these aliens? I mean, intelligent enough for, to send missionaries. You know? Okay, they, fair they enough. Have, they have reason. <laughs> Yeah, so I love space and I love the idea of space and I love the idea of exploring space, but I just don't want to be the one doing it. Um, gotcha. And also, I don't even want to go to like Colombia. So I don't know why I would go to some far <laughs> distant place. Um, learning languages is already difficult when it's Spanish and I already kind of know it. So I can't even imagine learning an alien language. Oh, but man. should we? Yes, we should. And I think we should baptize them and we should, uh, you know, teach them about our savior. I mean, I'm all in favor of it. I would go in a heartbeat. I'm not sure they would take yeah. me, but I would volunteer to go. <laughs> I don't know if I could do space food. It's just, uh, it's not my uh, thing. It's probably horrible. It's probably absolutely Also, I've horrible. seen Interstellar uh, one too many times, which is uh, once. So I, I don't know if I can handle that. Yeah, by the time you got there, everyone you know might be uh, gone. That is kind of depressing. Wow, but thank it, you for leading us down this road, Tito. But welcome. yes, I love the missionary <laughs> spirits. That Should we try to share our, uh, our, our love for Christ with everyone we meet? Yes, yeah, even if they're absolutely. extraterrestrials. That's right. As long as they're ra rational. Now, here's, here's a better question for you. Okay. Uh, would they have rights? Uh, I mean, like, are we talking like according to the Constitution? Sure. Or do you mean just I mean, because like, we talk about basic human rights, but we don't right. include dolphins in that. So would there be <laughs> basic alien rights if they're an intelligent species and they can I speak? I mean, I would say yes. So the whole thing about basic human rights, it relates to the fact that we are uh, rational animals, animals capable of thought, critical thought, um, capable of we are moral agents, right? That's what it ultimately comes down to as moral agents. We have mm -hmm. moral accountability and uh, certain rights that are, that separate us from the rest of the animal world. So I think any anything I that mean, is rational. That sounds that smart, <laughs> but I, I think I'd like to talk to a lawyer. Let's so talk, you know uh, Let's without further ado, why don't we introduce our guest today, who is a lawyer uh, and also a priest and may be able to help us with aliens. Uh, we didn't tell him that's why he was coming on the show for, but not why all. not? <laughs> Father Mike, welcome to the show. Did you expect to be asked about aliens right away? No, Casey, so this is probably going to be a very short podcast because I know squat about aliens. <laughs> what do you think legally? Do you, do you think they have any protections under the law? Um, yeah, I'll pass on that. I'll take the, I'll, I'll take the fifth. Um, okay. All right. Good idea. Well, we actually did not bring you on to talk about aliens, no. but... Uh, Tito, Tito has an imagination, and uh, you have a, a not only a legal mind, but you have an evangelical mind. You're someone that loves to share the faith and loves to share it as a community. You've been to many countries around the world. I'm wondering if you could tell us, um, you know, what, what got you into your missionary work, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about you going to different countries. So, um, I never went anywhere. I mean, I grew up in Western Massachusetts. I went to Siena. Um, mm -hmm. I was 37 when I entered the Friars. Um, mm -hmm. I've been to age. New York once. Uh, <laughs> from Western Massachusetts. From Western Massachusetts. <laughs> it was a big trip. Yeah. You know, wow. the, the Bronx was the Wild West. Uh, oh, wow. sure. Still is. Okay. Yeah. But in, in our program back then, in the Dvishit, basically after a novitiate, two days later, you were handed a plane ticket and you had your shots and they were told, 
you know, somebody will pick you up at the airport. <laughs> now we hope <laughs> I, I yeah. didn't I knew what I wanted to do with my life I, I loved being a lawyer and when mm-hmm. I entered they told me I could continue to do that mm-hmm. but what mm-hmm. happened was um, they decided that we should either go to Bolivia or Mexico and I'm thinking yeah this is a big city Merida it's like halfway between Cancun and Cozumel mm-hmm. it's 10 I've been weeks there. beautiful yeah I can get through this. I want nothing to do with Bolivia. I said, you know, <laughs> nobody, nobody there speaks English. They have mountains yeah. and llamas, and this is going to be the most miserable 10 weeks of my life. Um, and I, so I go to my novice directors and I say, you know, I've, I've prayed over this, and I think God is calling me to Mexico. <laughs> It's always a trick. And they smiled and they said, you know, that's funny because we (laughs) prayed on it last night too. We think God is calling you Bolivia. Well, yeah. so, you know, I go to Bolivia um, with my classmate, John Coughlin, and fell in love. Mm. Uh, Fell in love with the people, the culture, Mm. the fraternity. Um, The next year they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go back. But I want to work. Wow. I want to work in the jungle, um, where they had a project started by <laughs> one of our friars, Tex Dooling, and you know, wow. and what they did was they built roads and bridges and taught, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, built schools and clinics and taught about sustainable agriculture, and this was back in you know the the eighties and the seventies. I, I went in ninety mm-hmm. seven, and then it came time for my pastoral year, and. They said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go back to Bolivia. Um, and they said, what do you do there? I said, I, I don't know. I said, but I, I know I will find something. I want something around social justice. Um, mm. So I go down there and I say to people, um, you know, I'm, I'm more than open to do anything. The only thing is I don't want to work in a prison. Oh my gosh, Mike. Mm. How, how many years have <laughs> you been in formation at this point? You don't know. I, that that is not the strategy? Right. Not the st- no, no, but, but I said this to literally everybody. And I said, you know, I want to work on social justice. You know, I said the reason I gave was I'd been a lawyer for many years and I had done a fair amount of criminal law. I said, you know, I've already done that. I want to try something new. The real reason was I had no clue what I would do in a Bolivian prison. Mm. And so what happened was uh, I met with this guy who was a Marinol missionary and he worked for a social justice thing. And so we sat down, we had a lovely lunch, and he says, you know, you'd be really good at this, but what we really need is a chaplain at the maximum security prison. (laughs) And I said, no, 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 (laughs) no. So, and he said, well, I'm going to, we had this woman who works for us and she's a political prisoner who's just been released like a year mm-hmm. ago. Um, I'd like her to talk to you about our project. I said, sure. Send in the big guns. Yeah. That's right. Well, actually, That's right. She, was, she was a very little gun about this big. Exactly. But those are the ones who can influence you. Yeah. Yes, they are. So, you know, we're sitting there and she's saying, you know, this would be wonderful, but what we really need is a chaplain at the maximum security prison. And I said, no. I said, you know, I've done that. And she said, um, come and see. And mm. th- those words, I suppose I should have picked up on it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm very busy. And I wasn't at all. Um, <laughs> she said, let's meet me at this this plaza when the bus goes by. Um, uh, I'll pick oh. you up at 930. So I'm going, this is going to be awful. And and I walk, and I'm waiting there at 9.30. The bus is not there. 9.31, I am walking away because <laughs> I have fulfilled my obligation, and this is what yeah. I needed to. And then I hear her yelling, Miguel, Miguel, from the bus window. So I go, <laughs> and I get there, and it's out in the country. And, you know, it's this the maximum security prison, and there's these big walls on the outside, and then you go through, you get searched, there's the guards. And then on the inside, there's these taller, um, you know, barbed wire um, metal fences. 
and the prisoners basically roam around free from eight in the morning to eight at night. Okay. Mm. And I walk through, and there's a whole bunch of them just sitting there. And this place it just looks desolate, and and they look drugged out and just wiped out, um, which you would imagine in a Bolivian prison. And then um, this guy comes bounding up to me, yeah, much bigger than a normal Bolivia. And he says, you're Franciscan. And I said, yeah. He said, um, and he pulls out a towel. He said, oh, wow. I used to belong to a Franciscan parish before I ended up here. Um, he said, we've never had a Franciscan come here. And so I go to Mass, there was an old Canadian priest, a guy in his 80s that would come on Sundays. And it was, it was lovely. And then it's, it's time to go, and, and I'm, I'm very ready to go. And these three guys come up to me and they say, will you come back? Oh man, they got you. Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> every, Sunk their hooks into you. every fiber of my being says no. And yes comes out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look at your mouth, you stupid, why'd you say that? Yeah. And every day after that, I went back. Mm. And uh, yeah. I have a question. I wanna I wanna backtrack just for a second. Um so I wanna go back to that first time in Bolivia. Uh do you remember the moment when all you know you're saying I didn't want to come here to all of a sudden I have to get back here. Uh, was there, was it like a big experience that changed your mind? Was it always just like in prayer or just kind of walking around all of a sudden you had this moment of, I have to come back here. What was that like? It was the brothers there. Mm -hmm. It was the way I was treated as a brother. I, I remember when, you know, you're sitting there and you don't have the context. You don't know anything about the province. You don't know anything about any no. other places. You don't know these personalities, alive or dead, that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But it was the time that somebody stopped the conversation and asked me, um, do you know what we're talking about? I said, no. And he went on to explain it all. And then asked, do you have something like that in your province? Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it, and it was inviting me to go out with them on Saturday nights and, you know, coming to talk to me on Friday nights after the chapter of faults when, you know, some of them had been called out of the carpet. Still doing and, those, yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> wow. And, and, and it was the liturgy. I mean, it's so much more beautiful in Spanish uh, mm. from my perspective. It is mm. so much more lyrical. And, you know, I could sit there for 45 minutes in morning prayer and, and not bat an eye. Mm. Yeah, so I'm curious, uh, the brothers there that invited you, welcome you, hopefully you've had those experiences in the United States as well. I think there's something that transcends place and time. There's something just about being a friar that I find in every country I go to. Like, oh, uh, I've, I've had stories like this too. I've met people like this. I'm wondering, what's the same, what's different about your experience in Bolivia? W was it like walking into a completely different world? Or did you start to see, oh, this prison reminds me of this, and oh, this experience reminds me of this? I think with the brothers, it was funny because my mother asked me once, she goes, what is it you love so much about Bolivia? I said, I'll give you an example. I said, in the United States, we pay to see culture. If I want to go do something with the brothers, you know, we, we, we pay to go to the theater, we go to pay to go to a concert we pay to go see somebody dancing. I said, there, they do all those things in the friary. Everybody mm -hmm. played a musical instrument. We sat around um, uh, for birthdays, as I discovered, you know, midnight, all of a sudden, somebody starts singing mananitas <laughs> at the top of their lungs. And, and, and you know, you're, you're sound asleep at that point. <laughs> and you go out and it's, all the brothers mm -hmm. at midnight. And then they come in with the beer and the wine and the cake and you're up till yeah. two o'clock in the morning. But mm -hmm. it's like you were, you were special that day. 
Uh, and yeah, we had Jim McIntosh on a couple weeks ago, and he shared the same stories. And they come to your room, and they they sing to you, and you just happen to have fried chicken and beer with you in your room. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Yeah. Now, with the prison, the prison was different because uh, I knew how far outside my comfort zone I was. Mm. And every day I would say the same prayer. I said, God, I have no idea what I'm going to encounter today. I have no idea what you're going to ask me to do, or what you're going to throw at me. I said, but I'm trusting you here. Mm. And and every day for those five years that I was involved in the prison, it was God showing up in so many different ways. And, you know, sitting down with the guys and seeing them as people. I think one of the great graces was I, I, I didn't see them as criminals. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I sat there with a guy, and, and a fair amount of them were there for, for serious, serious crimes. A bunch of them were, were drug crimes, but mm. murder, rape, uh, armed robbery. And so one of them said, you know, I've always been told I was a rat. Um, my family thinks I'm a rat. Um, I always saw myself as a rat. But you come here every day and you eat with us. And, and you treat us like you, you're our brothers or we're our sons. Um, he said, I'm starting to think maybe I'm not a rat. Mm. And it was moments like that. And it was, was also discovering that what they really needed to do was to discover um, a sense of worth in a prison that most of them had nothing to do. And so, over the course of those five years, we developed a series of um, workshops for them to um, create things. I, I bought a shoemaking shop and moved it into the prison, mm-hmm. and they made soccer shoes. We had 40 oh, nice. guys fabricating cool. soccer balls. Um, we built a whole shop for metalworking. They made furniture. They repaired cars and buses. We we had guys doing, um, making false teeth, making jewelry, doing stuff with art. You know, we bring in professional teachers or some of the guys knew how to do this stuff themselves. And then we developed a market where they could sell it so they'd have money. Mm-hmm. And, and the level of crime in the prison dropped to, to literally nothing. So much so that by the end of the time, the government came in and, you know, we had a big celebration and declared it a model for what was possible for rehabilitation. But it was them. It was them seeing in themselves the ability mm. to move beyond what they had done. Mm. Um, it's amazing what dignity can do for people yeah, who have never experienced it. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, you know, give people dignity, give them a skill and watch what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's the same not only for prisons, but it's corporate life. I mean, yeah. what they found is, in studies is that people do not respond to getting a pay raise. They respond to getting their voices heard. Mm-hmm. And if you feel like you have a worth to the company and you feel like you're accomplishing something, people are willing to do incredible work. But you can get paid so much money, have a great corner office, and hate your life. And it, it's just crazy to think that, you know, whether it's a prison or corporate life, it's the same thing. Am I worth something? People are people, no matter their circumstances, the same things matter to us. And I think that uh, there's something beautiful about the fact that you're able to uh, tap into that, even in a place like a prison out in the country of Bolivia, in the countryside of Bolivia. You know, so I'm curious, and it sounds like a wonderful story of rehabilitation and kind of transformation. You'd said earlier, it's kind of what you'd expect from a Bolivian prison. I don't expect anything. I I don't know anything of what to expect. What I would sort of expect is that it's probably not well run or run at all. It's just kind of walls. Is is there a lot going on there normally? Before I got there, um, there had been... A lot of corruption. Um, mm. There had been um, riots. 
people have been murdered in the riots. Mm. Um, none of that happened while I was there. There was one time when I went to I went to prison, and you know I could tell by all the army cars that were there that something was wrong. And I walked inside, and um, I said, "What's the matter?" Um, we had very little water in the prison, and Catholic charities had drilled um, a pump um, f and were willing to do it, but all that the government needed to do was connect up the electricity to the prison. And it was like 800 meters of, of electrical cable. And they laid it one night and it was stolen. Mm. Oh my gosh. From the copper. Yep. Yeah. And, and what happened was the government says, we don't have the money, we can't pay for it. And the Catholic charity yeah. said, we don't have the money, we can't pay for it. So the prisoners were on the verge of rioting. And so I go in and I said, why are they doing this? And they explained everything to me. And they said to me, will you go in and talk to them? You go into the rioters? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Jeez. Did so, you have a martyr complex? <laughs> but I knew them. Mm -hmm. I knew them. And so I went in and I, I pulled together the leaders. Um, because when we would do these projects, we would have the leaders every year sit down with me. Okay, pick two projects. Who's going to manage them? Let's come up with price points and, and do all this. So I, so I knew the leaders well. And I said, um, do you trust me? And they said, you yes, them no. <laughs> and I said, will you give me two weeks to fix this? And they said, yes two weeks and I'm thinking what the hell am I going to do in two weeks this is as I'm did you have out. a plan <laughs> yeah no <laughs> no but two weeks seems sounded like a nice number <laughs> so yeah. at that point the plane will be delayed another 20 minutes <laughs> right at, at that point I had um, I was running a program for um, Latino vocations back in the states at Camillus mm -hmm eight months out of the year and was four months out of the year in the prison. So I, I get on the phone with Larry Hayes and I said, um, this is how much money I need. Can you take up a collection at the parish? Because mm -hmm. the people Camillus knew me and they knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think I've ever prayed so hard in my life. Larry sent me an email um, Sunday night, he said, or Monday morning, Monday morning. He said, you have your money. You have three times what you asked for. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Jeez. And so there was no riot, but it's just I have never felt so close to God as those five years because I knew that I wasn't doing this stuff. This was God, you know, mm. you know, the, the make me an instrument of your peace thing. Mm -hmm. um, but my prayer life has never been as good as it was then. Um, my, my sense of utter dependence. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Well, and you touch on something that so many friars we've had on. You're, you're about the 18th or so episode we've had here of being sent to a place you didn't necessarily want to go to yep. and then falling in love with it. I mean, yep. it seems like every single episode, someone is sharing something about that, and, you know, completely outside of your comfort zone on so many different levels, not only to not Mexico, but Bolivia, but then to a high security prison, and mm -hmm. then to be in with the prisoners and thrown in to fix the situation. <laughs> at any point along the way, do you say, you know, I've given a lot. At some point, there's a line. Actually, I... I wanted to go to Bolivia permanently, mm, wow. and I had asked to do that. And um, ended up being Pastor Camillus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's an interesting transition yeah. because everyone we've talked to has had some sort of missionary experience or kind of outside themselves, but they don't do that for their whole lives. Right. So. 
you you say you wanted to do that, and that's that's part of the story. But what did you do afterwards, and how how did your missionary work affect what you did? So um, we were two. Th there were three guys at Camillus, and and. Um, one had to leave to go cover another spot. So for two and a half years, Larry and I, and, and, and Jean-Marie handling the French, but largely Larry and I managed Camillus, which mm. no small feat, mm -hmm. which meant I couldn't go away to prison anymore, which... It's a which, funny statement to have. <laughs> yeah. Which hurt. Um, yeah. You know, it's in our life as Franciscans, there's this thing called the stripping. I mean, Francis had it over and over again. And it's, what did Francis have stripped away from him? What did it open him up for? I had the prison stripped away from me. But what it opened it up, for me anyway, was I had, I talked to a friend of mine. I said, you know, let's go on vacation. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. So we were starting a young adult group. And I noticed that Habitat had some stuff going on in D.C. And I also noticed they had this global village project. So I thought, oh, let's, I'm going to do that. And then he dropped out. And so I signed up for a trip. And it was to Costa Rica. I said, Costa Rica, that's a nice place. I'll go there and, and build houses. But I got back this thing. I'm sorry, we're full. And then I sent one off to Honduras, because I know some Hondurans, and I'm sorry, we're full. So I had a little conversation with God. I said, God, if you want me to do this, I'm signing up for Nicaragua and make it happen. <laughs> so I signed up for Nicaragua, and I got back, I'm sorry, we're full, but we have two friends who don't speak Spanish, who don't have mission experience, who are leading a trip to Guatemala. My guess is they'd be thrilled with you. Hmm. Okay. And and so I I signed up and they were thrilled to have me and so I remember getting on the bus, you know, we all fly in from different places and we get on the bus and I'm sitting in the back and guy leans over to me and he goes and we had to write little bios to send in. He goes, mm. Which one do you think is the monk? <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Yep. Did you know? <laughs> I had a clue. Right? <laughs> what was now? What was his reaction when he found out it was you? <laughs> oh no, he he thought it was hysterical. He thought it was hysterical. <laughs> and, Probably not what they expected. No, 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 and it's not, and it's why I don't immediately tell people because you know mm -hmm. you want to think get you know as a person, and mm -hmm. but what I did was I really enjoyed the trip, and I thought. You know, if you were to package this with a Franciscan retreat, this could be amazing. Mm. Because the extent of the spirituality, even though Habitat is a Christian organization, was, you know, we read, you know, a, a grace before meals. Mm. And then, you know, yep. hung around the pool at night drinking beer. Mm. <laughs> it's very <laughs> Christian. Very, yeah, very yeah. Franciscan as well. <laughs> feels, it feels very, Fra I say, feels very Franciscan. <laughs> yeah. and, uh. And so I decided to create that thing, which I called St. Francis Builds. And we launched it in Guatemala in, in 2006. Hmm. And we have been to 12 different countries building houses. We have um, done a fair amount of hurricane reconstruction in, in Texas and Puerto Rico and North Carolina. Um, we do it multiculturally, we do it multi-generationally, because we really, it gives us the feel of the church and mission. You know, we do prep in terms of having people understand Franciscan spirituality, Franciscan spirit of mission. We talk a lot about the stripping um, mm. from that perspective. And this, this past year, um, we have focused on educational building. We had done some in Nicaragua when I, I, I took a very young Casey Cole and five other classmates. That was the first time I'd ever left the country. Oh. Um, to build a school in Nicaragua. The schools mm -hmm. we build in 
in Oaxaca, where we're building now, we have <coughs> built, I think I figured it out the other day, 66 lay people, eight friars, and five communities have built five schools this past year. Wow. And, you That's know, yeah, no, and it's it's been wonderful. It, it, mm. it is the best best part of my life. Um, and I think it's a, it's a perfect combination of your personality, and we'll, we'll get to what we alluded to before of you being a lawyer. But you, you have um, a Franciscan spirit and and someone who wants to love and to care and to go out into the world. But you're also not a guy that's sitting in the garden with the bird bath. Uh, you're someone <laughs> who has a sense of organization and order and mission. And I very much admire that about you because not all the friars are like that. And so do you, do you struggle with that sometimes? Or where's that, that sense of wanting things to be a certain way come in and, and getting it done? Oh, um, Cause it's I, big what you've done. I mean, you've created a mm -hmm. whole organization in a ways. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't, there was never the intent. It was start mm. this first thing and there were 12 of us. And I remember uh, my co-leader was this middle school teacher who had just retired and, and God put it on my heart um, to walk up behind this woman, put my arm around her shoulder and say, would you like to run away with me to Guatemala? <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, In yeah, habit or out of habit? <laughs> No, I was coming out of mass, uh, <laughs> and and she said, without missing a beat, she goes, "Well, I'd have to check with my husband first. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is how God works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the woman who would co-lead with me the next twenty trips, all to foreign wow. countries, mm -hmm. and she was the perfect ying to my yang." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a big tent with the friars. Uh, yeah. You know, we come in all shapes and sizes, um, and each one brings its grace. And, you know, hopefully it's, you know, that I don't know which one of the books it's from where it says, you know, describe the perfect friar, and then they go through. Well, it's so and so, but no, it's really so and so, and it's the courage of Brother John and, and all of this. That, that is who we are, I think, at our best. Yeah, one of the things that I've uh, uh, that I I've learned had to do since joining the Friars, you know, I get very fired up about different social justice issues. Is that I can't do everything. I can't do all the things. I can't fight every fight. I have to fight the the battles that are important to me and trust that my brothers are going to fight the bat the other battles that uh, that are also important but that i can't dedicate energy to and um, it can be challenging sometimes but it's great to have a brother like you out there who you know you you have an idea and you go for it and you have the the abilities to bring people together and to um structure and organize all these different sort of missions and and these projects that contribute so positively to the to the lives of people all over so what he's getting at here is what are your weaknesses that other people have to do <laughs> that's not what i was getting at but that's a good question <laughs> they are, you've, how long have you known me they are legion <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that um and it's the same thing for brothers walking together i said that the pillar of a successful franciscan missionary is open open to what God wants to do. Not, not necessarily what my plan is, but what, what, what God is doing here. And, and to be flexible because you know, we'll make plans and, and frequently they're not going to unfold that way and people's timetable in another culture may be very different than ours. Um, to be patient because how things unfold, how things unfold in terms of relationships or projects we don't control over that, but for the things of God, be persistent, because we are in this for the long haul. And the, those are the four pillars, and the underlying foundation is humility, that this life is not about us. Uh, 
It's about what we're called to. And it may very well, and, and, and in my life, over and over again, has been to places I did not want to go. Mm. I did not want to go. And I think you've done a great job of, of helping others, guys, with that. You were the pastor of a place for many, many years right next to our formation house. So that's how you and I got to know each other. You were my uh, site supervisor twice, but you were site supervisor to a lot of guys. You tried to open people up to new experiences, whether it was teaching uh, uh, English as a second language, which I had never done before but got thrown into, or teaching eighth graders, going down to... Langley Park, uh, which was the uh, Hispanic mission, or to giving uh, donuts and coffee to the migrant workers early in the morning. And it's led you to have the idea you came up with a few years ago. You sent me a message, hey, I have this idea to re re reinvigorate the friars to go on mission. And uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. It got you the secretary of formation job. <laughs> and so now you do this professionally, helping mm -hmm. the guys in formation to be open and to go where they're not going. Uh, everything you ever wanted, right? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you had to see it coming. I mean, you'd yeah. been doing it unofficially for so many years. Uh, I, it was funny because at your ordination, um, before we processed in, Larry Hayes collars me. At that point, he's, he's vicar oh, no. of Oregon yeah. Province. Mm -hmm and says mm -hmm. to me, um, oh, by the way, uh, I've got a big ask. <laughs> you love those. Good start. And, and, and I'm thinking, huh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I go, should I be worried? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so all through your ordination, um, Forgive me, but I'm not focused on you. <laughs> so he Wait, didn't he tell you beforehand? He, no! Yeah, he left it at that? Oh, oh my gosh. That's the that's worst. That's unforgivable. So, and, and afterwards, you know, <clears throat> I'm looking around for him. And in typical Larry fashion, you know, before he became provincial, he's gone. Yeah, he's a, a super introvert. Just yeah. too many people. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we were, we were actually doing hurricane reconstruction in Tarboro, North Carolina, right after your, I, I left from your ordination to go out there. And we were replacing a roof. I'm literally on the roof, scrape, and I have great fear of heights. This was like me way super far out of my comfort zone. And, you know, taking off old shingles. And the phone rings, and it's Larry. And he says, Are you busy? Can you talk? <laughs> yeah. I said, Actually, La yes, goodbye. <laughs> I said, Larry, Larry, um, I'm ripping a roof off. I said, but your little comment on Saturday has me a little concerned. <laughs> I said, if I don't fall off in the next 20 minutes, I'll call you back. But so I call him back and he said, um, because I had been saying for many years that the immersion experience that I went on, my classmate Yatsing and John went on, and a good number of friars from my province did, it changed us. Mm -hmm. It, it gave us a sense of minority that we wouldn't have had before. It gave us ability with Spanish language that made us much more able to serve the, the church. Um, it gave us entree into immigrant communities that were one of the great richnesses of all of our lives. And I said, and we stopped that. I said, we need to start that up again. He said, you remember when you said that? He said, we have a program. We want to call it Brothers Walking Together. He said, we can't launch it unless somebody is willing to lead it. Will you do this? Um, and for the first time when somebody asked me something, I said, well, you know, I'm an extrovert and I have ADHD, so my tendency is to jump and say yes and then figure <laughs> out for the next two days, how am I going to get out of this? I can't really. What did that I at do? <laughs> yeah, Tito has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> so I said, um, I said, you know, I love the idea. I said, but I have to think this through. And I said, you know, they just called me to be visitator in Guadalupe. Um, mm -hmm. So this is going to be a little bit of a challenge, you know, doing both these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I said, where do you want to do this? Oh, you know, we've got, you know, 12 different places we'd like you to check out. And I said, let me think about this. 
but it was just yeah, they're like, not on the east coast either no it like was vietnam the, right and it, it jamaica was, and, it was mindanao and vietnam and morocco and guaymas yeah. and yeah. yeah when you get some free time just check them out yeah <laughs> but i had never been more sure of anything in terms of like right off the bat that everything that had happened before was preparing me to do that mm. and it was like this is almost choreograph choreographed. Yeah. And and it's almost like there's a plan. <laughs> and it's not mine. Yeah. Exactly. But but I swear to God, in, in my life, and I think most people's lives, God loses nothing. Mm. God loses absolutely nothing. There is nothing yep. that God can't use from the crosses we've endured, from the successes, and let's be honest, after 35, as Richard Rohr says, for men to grow, most of it comes from our falling down and getting back up, and normally with the help of other people. Mm. So um, I travel around the world, um, picked Jamaica, Guaymas, Mexico, San Francisco, and Tangiers in Morocco to launch it. Mm. and then settled in to be visitator for the next six months in, in Albuquerque in the pandemic hit. Yeah. Wow. Ah, yeah. And then we launched the following year um, yeah. mm -hmm. with, with four sites. San Francisco, Philly, because we wanted to pull things in because things it was 2021 and still very sure. unsure. Yeah. But Jamaica and um, on the border in Elfrida. I hope that we do eventually get to Guaymas. It's a very special place to my heart because when I was in high school, I went on mission there with the friars. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. My high school was built by, was founded by the, the friars of Santa Barbara. And so that connection uh, brought us down there. And it's just wonderful people there. It's a wonderful community. And it needs a lot. It needs a lot of love. So I think that's a, a great place for friars to go in the future. Now, Tito, is it this. It seems to be a great program. No, I mean, I was ready to launch there both years. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, the, the two friars that had been stationed there, one had moved to Honduras and one had moved to mm -hmm. California, and the third one died. Oh, uh, uh, and they had trouble getting people to go. So, Tito, let me know when you're moving down there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have him. Not yet. <laughs> you can do this from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe Tito's one day. going on trips, you know, uh -huh. and I and, and I have as well. I took uh, students down to Jamaica uh, twice, one with college students, one with high school students. We're just planning our next one. Tito, you've been on uh, pilgrimages and mission trips as well. I, I have. think what you're describing, Mike, is is a great. I don't want to say compromise, but you wanted to be a full-time missionary, and you got an opportunity to come back to the states and bring people who would otherwise never go on mission on mission for ten days. And there's something really beautiful about opening people's eyes and letting them have that first experience. I know, I mean, it was for me. That was the first time I was outside the country. And to yeah. be able to do that with the brothers in their formation is, is invaluable. You know, the, the neat thing about it at Camillus was to watch people, multi-generational people, multicultural people, develop deep relationships within the parish with one another. You know. Kids would go to mass, or younger people go to mass, and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're running up to these other people, and this is, this is like family. And now, what I've done these last couple of years is try and use it as a vehicle to bring together different communities within the province. Mm. So Hartford and um, Camillus have done a number. Durham and Camillus have done one. Um, we are going to have some people come from San Luis Rey that Lalo is going to um, surface so we can Great. start it out there. Mm. We've had uh, like 25 friars go over the course of the last yeah, 20 years. Yeah, it's a great yeah. way to connect. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a great idea bringing together friars from different ministries or, or you know, different worship communities to, and people from those communities as well to do something together. I think that's an incredible way to kind of bridge the distance of our province. Friars from so many different religions all in one place. It's beautiful. <laughs> You'd be <Yeah>. surprised. <laughs> yeah. 
So, brother, I want to take a, a big step back here. So we see where you've been and where you're going. We see the, the, the desire for mission and how you're sharing that. How were you missioned? How, how do you go back and you're, you're a lawyer? You know, what, you, you touched on it just briefly, but talk about that transition from where you were and what you thought of your life to how you ended up with us. So I went to Siena, uh, not because I had this great devotion to St. Francis, I had it was no the idea. Wild West. It's the farthest west you'd ever been. <laughs> no, Cooperstown. Cooperstown. Oh. oh, okay. That's another hour and a half. Yeah. Um, but what happened, you know, I grew up, we went to a novena every year that was um, for Francis Xavier. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I had no idea. Wrong who, Francis. Wrong Francis. <laughs> well, for somebody who's ended with their life with missionary, maybe not. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> true. But... You know, I went to Siena and I went to Holy Cross because my uncle had gone there. And Siena just felt like the most perfect fit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, wow, this is the only place I want to go. And they're going to give me a lot of money because we don't have a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but I remember I had been there for a year and a half and thinking, Oh my God, I have to leave this place in two and a half years. This is wonderful. And it was, the, the experience was great. No desire to become a friar. I had no, God, my, no. my, my whole <laughs> life. And I wasn't particularly close to any friars until the last year when Jerome Massimino was the friar on our floor. Hmm. Hmm. And, and many of the guys uh, became close to Jerome. And I continued to get together with a good friend of mine and he would drive up from Jersey and I would drive over from Western Mass when I was practicing and we would um, have dinner with Jerome and then one day um, I got a call from him and saying do you know that Jerome just took over a parish in Hartford <laughs> and, and I said no well I had left the church I had had an amazing experience of liturgy and community at Siena. And then I went back to my parish where it was kind of what we used to call the ABC cycle of homilies. Mm. Oh no. Abortion, the building fund, contraception, repeat. Okay. And you know, you, you, okay. you, yeah. you're, yeah. si you're sitting there with your grandmother um, <laughs> yeah, you're not sure which one of you is more uncomfortable. <laughs> mm, yeah. And, and I just waiting for that building fund homily to come back. Yeah. Because you're not going to name money from me because I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. But it, it just, it was missing what I had. You know, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Mm. And I tried some other places that didn't seem that different. But then well, I went to this place where Jerome was. They had just taken it over. It had been this place where the friars had been asked to come in and do this new model of ministry called urban ministry, where they would um, you know, have a sacramental center, but they would do a bunch of other things in the city, not unlike what the two of you are talking about doing. Um, so I started going to mass there and then one Sunday, Jerome corners me and he says, you're good with people and you're good at organizing things. I'd like to get involved in this new ministry that we have. I said, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, listen, Jerome, I'm already on 13 different boards, commissions, and committees. Um, I don't have time. I said, I'm more than happy to write out a check. And he said, <laughs> He said, well, I'll take, and I wrote out a check, and it was a rather nice check. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're yeah. not going to get, back. yeah, we'll get back to that. I'm not going to turn that down. <laughs> he said, well, I'll take your check, but I still want you to get involved. And I said, what is it? He said, AIDS ministry. Hmm. Oh. I said, no. <laughs> um, he said, why? I said, well, first of all, I've never done ministry in my life. Hmm. I had not been involved in youth group or any of that hmm. stuff. I said, um, I don't know all that much about you know, what a ministry to people with AIDS would look like. Um, and I said, no. He said, well, think about it. 
And I said, no. He said, just think, <laughs> think about, about it. what? I said, no. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Right. You don't right. know Jerome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what happened was I said, maybe I'll think about it. So the next week I go to church and he calls me over and he introduces me to the person and says, um, this is Mike Johnson. He's going to be working on the AIDS retreat with you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Saw that coming a mile away. And, yeah. and I go, I go, come here, come here. And I said, I told you no. He said, you told me maybe. I said, well, the answer is no. He said, well, think about it. Well, <laughs> this goes on for four weeks until I say, yeah. if I do this one thing, will you leave me alone? Oh, come on. So naive. Right. And, and, he, and he lies and said, yes. <laughs> so I go on this thing way outside my comfort zone thinking this is going to be the worst weekend of my life this is a ministry that this is them launching it and this is at a time when AZT had just come out AIDS was basically a death sentence for most mm. people Right. I'm a lawyer, I fix things mm. I can't fix this so I go there and then they start to arrive. They are black and they are white and Latino. They are gay and they are straight. They are people who haven't darkened the door of a church for decades mm. and those that work for the church. And people who had um, were IV drug users and people whose partner had stepped out. One woman who found out when she um, had her pregnancy test. Mm -hmm. And they arrive, and there's a heaviness when they arrive. But there are these friars, and there is this this one nun in particular who just makes it come alive. And and I watched how they were with the people, just encouraging, and the sent this Franciscan sense of humor that I hadn't really experienced. And over the course of those couple of days, I watched this lift and a sense of hope, the sense that God wasn't done with them, that God, in a world where they've been pushed to the margins in so many ways, here was a Catholic church saying, all are welcome. You especially are welcome. Mm -hmm. And then there was this healing service. Well, I'm a New England Catholic. We don't know anything about this stuff, <laughs> laying, out, laying out our hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm Bray, watching, pay yeah. no bray. I went oh, to mass. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, right. Come on. G growing up in New England, this was a sign of peace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sitting there, and there's this guy in front of me. And he's, there's nobody on either side of him. And all of a sudden, it's, it, it is pretty powerful. The guy starts to weep. And the little voice in my head says, you should do something. And then the normal voice that I normally listen to says, you just stay where you are and you let somebody that knows what they're doing take care of it. And the debate goes on back and forth. And then all of a sudden, I feel myself getting up. I go down the end of the aisle. I go back. I sit down next to him. I put my arm on his shoulder. I don't say anything to him. I don't look at him. He stops crying. I take the hand back. It's over. I just go. End of the weekend, everybody's saying goodbye. And, and it is marked the difference between how people came in and how they went out. And this guy comes up to me and he says that this has been one of the most important weekends in his life because it gave him hope. Mm. It told him that there, were, there was a place where he was treated just like everybody else and that he was loved for who he was. And he said, the most powerful moment of that is when you saw me in my pain and you were not afraid to reach out and comfort me. And we hugged. And I went into Jerome's office after that and had a beer. And, and Fine, you get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, um, you know, if I've had a more powerful weekend in my life, I don't quite remember what it was. Mm. 
And then he asked me to be the head of pastoral planning, which we called Reform oh my gosh. Big, and then the vice president <laughs> of the Barrier's Council. The last thing I did, I was the president <clears throat> of the Barrier's Council. There wasn't oh there a goodness. promise that he wasn't going to ask you to do anything else? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and I hear stories like this, and, and my first reaction sometimes is, man, does anyone know what they're doing? I mean, you, this person, you know, yourself, would, you didn't want to do this. You had no idea what you were doing, and you have this powerful effect on people. And it's like, man, we're all just so lost, and I, I want someone to be, like, in control. But when I rest on it and think, man, isn't that wonderful that God is able to work through even me? And look at these extraordinary things he's able to do with the people who simply show up. Uh, and it gives me hope that I have many experiences like that where, like, I was not qualified to do this, and that's fine. They are the greatest moments in my life as a friar. Mm. It, 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 it wasn't the things that I planned out well. It was it basically food and the spirit go through you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, I think that's, that's part of being Franciscan is, you know. I was talking with Kurting about um, the Last Brothers walking together. Director of media. Yeah. yeah. Direct, uh, director of media, yes. And um, I was talking about creating a video about brothers walking together, and I said, I would call it Adventures with the Spirit because our life, when it's well lived, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't yeah. want to let you go before getting you an opportunity to talk about another aspect of our life, which is the brothers, particularly your classmates, because <laughs> talking about people who don't know what they're doing, being thrown together in a diverse group of people that are from all different parts of the world, uh, and you have, you have an eclectic bunch uh, you've mentioned them, uh, you, you've alluded to them. Tia and I are thinking of stories in our heads because they are just interesting folk, yourself included. Mm -hmm. What was it like, maybe just your postulancy or going through formation with these different guys? Do you have a favorite story? I, I have a few stories that you've told, but I, I'm curious what yours is. Um, I remember the day I walked into the Bronx, my very first day, and they dropped me off. I was the last one there. And I remember walking into the rec room, looking around at this crew of, we were eight, thinking to myself, who the hell am I going to be friends with in this group? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, 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 not that I was judging or anything. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> who do I have anything in common with? Yeah. Know? Yeah. So what was the answer? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, you got the short redhead from Queens who well, not, uh, it, went to night school. It, it's not so red anymore. Who, who went to? <laughs> yes, that's true. Who went to Hunter College? You had the uh, the young uh, the young Polish guy mm -hmm. uh, who is going to have a movie made about him <laughs> for <laughs> all day. the crazy things he's done in life. <laughs> and those are the ones who survived. Right. Yeah. Which is nice because th there's two of them that I still stay in touch with um, yeah. fairly regularly. But, but Jacek and John, you know, we were, it was funny, in our class we had those that were more on the traditional side, we had those that were in the middle, and we had those that were more on the liberal side in terms of the church. Mm -hmm. One survived from each group, <laughs> and we all, yeah. we all moved to the middle except for maybe Jacek. <laughs> <laughs> Jacek was too busy moving mountains to be moved. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, you know, John, I give John so much credit. You know, John has gone to places as diverse as Camden and Irenaeus. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's gone to Macon, you know, he's in Pompton now, but he also was at UGA. He almost died in the jungle. <laughs> Got yeah. stung by something or whatever, complained that Yasik was a block or two ahead of him in the jungle and he had to slow down. A block or two ahead. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you do when your life when your life is a city, it's that's your frame of reference. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you don't want to go on a hike with Yasik. It, it, it's not no. gonna end well. <laughs> he but, will probably have a spear in one hand. <laughs> um I remember 
Yasik's passion for justice, peace, and integrity of creation has, from the day that I met him, um, I would tease him. Um, I, I learned that, you know, sometimes you don't tease people that are bigger and stronger than you. Um, <laughs> In, in, in a moment of um, peak, I called him a Polish tree hugger. Um, he literally picked me up and shook me. <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember Mike Tyson screaming, put him down, put him down. <laughs> the friar, not the boxer. Right. right. Well, right. I, I apologized two days later. We didn't have another argument for, I think, 25 years. Yeah, until you were pastor and he was vicar and he wanted to hang the the clothes outside the window or something. <laughs> no, it was, it was, um, no, I will tell this story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably not. <laughs> no. But I, I will tell you, yeah, Yatsik, when, when I was asked to be pastor, I mean, it was just Larry and I, and I told John O'Connor, um, I said, you know, I'm not doing this alone, just the two of us. I can't. I've never been a pastor before. Mm -hmm. And Yatsik, who wanted to do something else, came to Camillus to support me. Mm -hmm. And and that, to me, is what a brother does. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. When you are blessed with a brother who is that and more than name only, he, he was willing to make the sacrifice because he knew what I had been through um, just the two of us carrying it, and he wanted to make sure. And he had a huge impact on the parish um, in terms of totally transforming it into a parish that was deeply committed to justice, peace, and integrity creation, more than any other place in the province, mm -hmm. um, my legacy province, and maybe any place in our, in our mm -hmm. new province. But he also influenced me in terms of my preaching. I, I preach much more frequently on JPIC issues. I do interfaith community organizing here as, as the head of the Franciscan Center for Urban Ministry because of Yatsik, because he, he pushed me to uh, allow it into the parish and he, he told me why and I saw the fruits of it. Um, I watched how he preached about it. And, and so it's, we, we learn from our classmates. You know, we can laugh about yeah. the faults and the foibles, but um, everybody's got their gifts. Mm -hmm. everybody's well, got and gifts. he probably did that because he saw your witness of going to places that were not necessarily your first choice and how it changed you. I think these things come back to us all the time. The mm -hmm. measure with which we measure will be measured out to us, as, as Scripture says. Right. And so the, the example that we set, I think people learn how to treat us based on how we treat ourselves. So thanks for being a good example. Yeah. On the good days. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, it's been great to have you. Thank you so much for your witness. Thank you so much for your continued work forming our friars so that Tito and I don't have to. So you're the best. Thanks. Thank you. Tito. Yeah. You ready to go on mission? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely I am. Um, I mean, it's, a mission is always something that I've wanted to do. Um, I know you and I have something lined up, but after that, 100%, I look forward to being on mission. Uh, one of the things that I admire about about Mike and so many other guys who kind of live, uh, I think, a very radical Franciscan life is that willingness to say yes when asked. You know, even if it's something that doesn't feel right or we might be opposed to. Yeah, I mean, you and I have both had those instances in our lives, and I'm sure we're not done yet. Uh, right. It's great to have ideas as we do. It's great to come in and say, here are my gifts and here's what I can offer. And maybe yep. we build upon them, but maybe we're called to use them in different ways that we didn't expect. And I love the way he talks about how you can you can transform those desires even where you are. You know, bloom mm -hmm. where you're planted. So you have a desire yeah. for mission. You can't go on mission. Well, do it occasionally. Do it a week right. out of a year. C create your own, you know, 5013C, your own organization that right. goes and helps people do that uh, in a way that you probably couldn't if you stayed there all by yourself or, or with help, the, uh, all full time. Right. Help bring other people to mission, too. You know, that's mm -hmm. I think that's the uh, uh, the problem solver in him. You know, like uh, I want to do this thing. I can't do this thing. I can do it a little bit or, you know, I can help other people to do it. Right. I see a need here. I want to fix. I want to address that need. I think um, having that sort of 
uh, can do attitude, that sort of perspective on even if I can't do the thing that I want to do right now, there's a way I can still address something that is lacking is a really great gift that, uh, that Mike has. Yeah, and the adaptability of the Franciscan charism that yes. you're not going to live in the same place forever and you can bring sure. so many different skills and gifts to different places um, and be influenced by different people. I think it's wonderful that throughout our lives we will live with so many different friars. There's something beautiful, obviously, to getting married and committing yourself to one person and a family for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. But there's also something beautiful and, as we both know, extremely challenging about mm -hmm. switching every three or five years to the new brothers to love and new brothers mm -hmm. to tolerate and new brothers mm -hmm. to learn from. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful thing uh, in all of its rough edges. Yes. Uh, you get moments like he had with brothers who, you know, will stop what they're doing to help you out or stop a conversation to say, are you following and do everything that they can to either support you or include you. And then there's times where brothers, you know, don't do that. But um, that's true of any family. You know, there are those people who are very who excel at, at caring for others and making sure everyone has a voice. Yep, and I think the best lesson we learned from this is that we are not always the main character in every story, right? That's right. And when you're not the main character, you still get to be a minor character, and that's pretty great. Yes, we thank is. you all for listening. We thank you for supporting the Friars uh, in all that you do. We hope that you might consider being a minor character one day. We'll have more episodes coming up in just a few weeks. Peace. <laughs>